Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. A few months ago, we all did an episode on introversion, which was pretty interesting for a trio of primarily extroverted people. So this week, we um, ought to be uh, playing in our home stadium of extroversion (laughs) and uh, taking a look at what Jung meant by attitudes. Uh, He called introversion and extroversion fundamental attitudes. And it shapes our point of view of whether we are primarily oriented to our inner world of ideas and growth and personal process, or do we primarily turn to the external world, which is what extroverts do, to get our energy from people, things, places. So let's us now uh, turn outward to this topic and one another and see what we make of it. So maybe we can uh, just unpack a couple of definitions of extroversion from a Jungian standpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, Jung, of course, has quite a bit to say. Um, He says it's an attitude type characterized by concentration of interest on the external object. In other words, uh, our sources of gratification, interest, challenge, pleasure, connection are outside, that we look for a conversation with a friend or an activity or a book or something external to sort of feed and fuel our, uh, our internal fire. And extroverts go outside to get a, a stimulation. Then they come back inside and reflect and then go back out to get more and then reflect, but it starts with going out. And introverts have kind of the opposite process. They go in and check in of what do I want? What am I thinking? What do I need? Then they go out in order to get some sort of pre-selected input or interaction. All of us have both, of course. But my analogy is often to uh, standing up and which leg do we habitually have our weight on. And it's not something we can choose. As we've said in other episodes, that part of the acorn that grows into the oak tree (laughs) metaphor is that each of us has a typology that blossoms and that we notice over time. And that these typologies are intrinsic to Jung's model of individuation. And I think The use of typology in this regard has fallen out of fashion, but Mm -hmm. I still find it really interesting that Jung was very compelled by the idea of the quaternity and that human beings have four fundamental functions and that the balancing 
of these functions constitutes the goal of individuation. So feeling types are required to develop thinking, intuitive types are required to develop sensation, and this balancing process can be understood more clearly mm -hmm. by discovering what our conscious personality configuration is. And extroversion and introversion is a huge part of understanding how energy flows inside our system and engages the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things about this topic is that if I'm if I'm right about this, Jung coined the term extroversion. Yes. And it really has entered the culture now. It's part of most kind of personality typologies. So it's considered to be a very um, robust concept. And it has really come into the language through Jung. Yeah. And it's important, all those functions, the four functions, but they're conditioned like sort of a, a superstructure by whether we're primarily extroverted and outward turning or introverted and inward turning. And Jung considered all this so important that he said, every judgment made by an individual is conditioned by his personality type. And every point of view is necessarily relative. In other words, we never get away from our subjectivity. There's very little in the way of, according to this way of looking at the world, little inarguable objectivity. So it's sort of like the fish is in the water. And, you know, if we're in the water all the time, whether it's fresh water or salt water, um, it's just the way things are. And this is one of the great benefits of studying typology is we can slowly develop a kind of objectivity about ourselves in the water we swim in. Yes. And this is, of course, very important in terms of friendships and intimate relationships. Extroverts, for instance, just assume everyone else is an extrovert or introverts just <laughs> assume uh, the opposite. And when we can understand and name and differentiate mm -hmm. these distinctions in personality, one, we can take it much less personally, and that two, we can imagine our way into another typology, which can develop some empathy and compassion for people that can be remarkably different from ourselves. Yeah. And Jung developed this notion of typology in part as a response to his break with Freud in an effort to understand what happened between the two men, you know, that had such a profound effect on him. And he was wanting to understand how it was that they saw the world so differently. And then when uh, Myers and Briggs, a mother daughter team, developed the Myers Briggs type indicator using Jungian concepts. That was after World War I, as partly as a result to understand why people get into conflict. So, Joseph, I think you're, you're right that it can be really helpful in pointing out to us or giving us a framework for understanding why people might be different than we are and how they might arrive at really different understandings of the same phenomenon. And all this happens in the stage of our culture. For instance, America is a particularly extroverted culture, and we tend to idealize people who love to be out front, are the ones who want to perform, are the ones that want to uh, talk to the crowd, the ones who want their attainments to be visible to the world, mm. the life of the party, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, the person that can just walk up to anyone and stick out their hand and say hello and start a conversation. And we idealize that kind of extroverted potency. And often introverts are left feeling uh, mismatched in many environments. But there are other cultures, Japan being a very different culture that prizes introversion. And many people who've gone to Japan have noticed this. For instance, you know, on the subway, people are silent and it's considered mm -hmm. bad form mm -hmm. to be walking around glad handing people. The expectation is that the consciousness will turn within in a very considered way. There's exclusions to all of this, but we can see trends in culture and consequently 
Mm -hmm. groups of people feel better or more ill-fitted to where they were born. Yeah, I remember when I when I worked in the former Yugoslavia in the 90s, I was based in Croatia, but uh, would sometimes go into Bosnia. And I remember everyone on the team loved going to Bosnia. Everyone loved in particular going to Sarajevo, even though it was under siege by the Serbs at that point. And I would try to notice why. And you got one feeling walking around Croatia, which I suspect is a little bit more of an introverted culture. You know, things were beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful country, but it people were fairly reserved out on the streets. But I remember going to, to Sarajevo and being out on the streets and, and just groups of people laughing. And it just gladdened your heart. And it made you, it, it just, it, there was something so wonderful about it. And I think that's because the, the Bosnian culture may have been a little bit more extroverted. And so that, that kind of... Uh, public display of of fun and warmth was just more near the surface. Mm -hmm. I also spent time at one point in in Moscow and it was it was people were so reserved almost to the point of being cold in public. Yeah. But once you got inside their homes of course there was incredible warmth, but I think that's another example maybe of how introversion looks in a culture. So there's a way in which um, I think we're tilting into extroverted feeling function and or extroverted thinking function, but we find, we react and can get a, an easier read on someone or in a culture that's extroverted. Mm -hmm. If things seem silent, then what's the meaning we make of it? Is it, is it cold? Am I not accepted? Then we start to project onto, well, you know, these people are like that, or this person always does this. Whereas it's easier to read what's going on with extroverts. They're kind of out there. And if you're an extroverted feeling type and you're in a very introverted uh, environment, it, it can provoke a lot of anxiety because mm -hmm. like you said, Deb, you you don't get the response back that you might get from another extroverted feeling type. And you project onto that, oh my gosh, they don't like me, they're not listening, <laughs> whatever it is. And one way that Jung described this urge is that extroverts crave the outer object and want to identify with it and create a voluntary dependence on it. So for instance, in that environment where you wish that people were warmer, the extrovert comes into a situation, maybe you're coming into a new job, you've just been hired and you're trying to make connections in the office. Extroverts have a natural sense of wanting to merge with the people around them and to identify with them. And in order to do that, extroverts also need a lot of information and encouragement from those people so that they can come up with a sense of who the other is. It can make extroverts often seem very mercurial and changeable as they're seeking to come into relationship with outer objects. But that's not a loss of identity. And when Jung was talking about merging, he was not using that word with any kind of pathological intent around it. The way I think with a lot of boundaries work that's uh, come up in modern psychology, there's a different kind of concern about merging. But this is a kind of imaginative merging with other objects, which allows extroverts to be sometimes unusually attentive and attuned. Mm -hmm. to other people in other situations. But but it can also be a little bit of a liability if you're not aware of it. I remember in analytic training, going through analytic training, you have periodic meetings with groups of analysts. So you're a training candidate, you walk into a room and there's three analysts that you don't know and it's either ex an exam or a committee meeting and, you know, you sit down and sometimes that group of analysts doesn't, for whatever reason, didn't necessarily provide that relational 
frame that I would be looking for as someone who has a strong extroverted side and, and a strong feeling function. And I'm talking about smiling, nodding as you're talking, maybe just making little noises to say, yeah, I understand, keep going. But rather just kind of looking at you, asking a question and then looking at you with, with no facial expression, with no body movement. And what I realized is that, that that would make me so anxious, but I wouldn't know why I was anxious. And then once I realized that it was that lack of relational grounding that was being offered, it still made me uncomfortable. But I, I understood what it was and I recognized that my job was simply to tolerate the anxiety and not get completely, not to go to bits about it because that can happen. You know, we're, we're in this environment, we're not getting that, that sort of encouragement back. We're looking to the outer object, as it were, the other person to kind of help us along and it's not coming. And if we're an extroverted feeling type, that can absolutely make us go to bits without us even understanding why we're going to yeah. bits. And then we lose our thread and we start stumbling and we're stuttering and, you know, it's like it's a disaster. And sometimes you're like, well, I don't even know why it was a disaster. So I'll see this a lot of times with clients that I work with and I'll sort of frame it like this. And it, it can really make a difference to be given this way of understanding what's happening. And it's like, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable if they're not giving you something back. I mean, I've presented to groups of introverts, too, where I'm up there teaching and no one's looking at me. No one's <laughs> smiling. No one's nodding. No one's like raising their hand and saying, hey, Lisa, what about this? And it, it's much harder than presenting to a group where there's more extroversion, where people are, are laughing or, you know, interrupting me to ask a question. And I, and I have, I have that feeling of engaging with them in this connected way. And I, I just always tell myself, you know, this is, this is just something I makes me uncomfortable and I, all I have to do is tolerate it. It, it does change the way we make meaning fundamentally, it's just exactly what you're saying, that instead of saying, oh my gosh, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I not connecting? What's going on here? What's wrong with them uh, that they're not responding? It's just sort of like, ah, oh, we can put that typological lens on it. Exactly. Of this other person is just very introverted and it makes me uncomfortable rather than not knowing why this dynamic is happening. It gives us an operating manual, both for interactions with others and knowing how we work of, I like extroversion. I like relational stuff. And now that I know that, I can go into this challenging uh, committee meeting and just know that we have different orientations. And that for the extroverted feeling type, if they're prepared to sacrifice a bit of that relational feeling tone, they can be better prepared to ground themselves in some other perhaps auxiliary function in their personality. So another way of summarizing this is that extroverted feeling types are driven to harmonize with outer people and objective situations. Yeah. They want to be in good harmony. They want to have a, a positive, affected relationship between themselves and the outer situations. They tend to not want discord. So feeling types are often highly beloved. They're capable of a tremendous amount of appreciation. They're capable of a tremendous amount of sympathy. But as we all know, extroverted feeling types can have to do some extra work to ask themselves, what do I as discrete a uh, being really feel? What, what mm -hmm. are my emotions deeply within myself that are not conditioned by the group of people I'm with or the organization that I'm identified with? Right. So that differentiation. And that can be um, very difficult work. Let's pop over to the idea of extroverted thinking. Mm. So extroverted thinking types tend to become enamored of established 
and often arcane ideas, and they're vulnerable to not thinking freshly about what's expressed. So extroverted thinking types had to have a tendency to collect thoughts that are deeply gratifying to them and want to re-express them in various circumstances and expect other people to adopt those thinkings, which is basically a self-confession on my part. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough. I, I'm resonating to the self-confession about extroverted <laughs> feeling types. <laughs> so as an extroverted thinking type, I have a tendency to want to elevate certain ideas and elevate intellectual formulas, <laughs> which, which solve problems for me and then for the world at large, which uh, creates this tremendous uh, impulse in me to provide sagacious advice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is like the plague of my analytic style. <laughs> <laughs> Whether I'm biting my tongue because I want to, you know, give this great formulaic thinking clarity or whether it tumbles out of my mouth in the middle of every session. But it is part of wanting to take my inner thinking function and cast it out into the room, cast it out to be played with by the people around me. An introverted thinking type might function the same way, but they would be very happy to talk to themselves about various thoughts that they enjoy. But extroverted thinking types uh, enjoy pontificating, or as my mother <laughs> used to say, don't be such a maven. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's very funny. I'm, I'm resonating to um, someone, someone close to me who uh, has this in his personality and, uh, it's kind of adorable, but it's also kind of irritating. And <laughs> you know, um, I've been told that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this this person is, um, you know, just loves ideas and loves to learn about things and and loves you know facts and you know must spend a lot of his time immersed in. I don't know what different just learning deeply about these things. And it's like, you get together with him and he's like, going to tell you all about the Punic Wars. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So it's interesting that people who have different typologies, different attitudes, uh, both enrich us and irritate us. <laughs> And that was one of the great uh, pieces of wisdom that a friend and colleague once offered. She said, we irritate each other. And uh, I've always remembered it because of exactly that same reaction that you had, Lisa, of like, oh, here we go on the Punic Wars. But actually, a little irritation and a little frustration, if we can use it, helps us grow. Mm hmm. Mm hmm be kind of a sad and sorry world if everybody saw things exactly the same way, especially the Punic Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and while that may seem a bit obscure, we could suppose that the entire age of enlightenment was driven by extroverted thinking and the idea of establishing principles that have universal applicability is part of extroverted thinking. So even my own attachment to studying uh, Hermetic Kabbalah or other kinds of arcane systems where there are certain ways of thinking and certain cosmologies that then get passed down as universals to an extroverted thinking type, that's, you know, the most delicious thing they've tasted, you know, all day. And I think also extroverted thinking types can feel whether or not a particular idea is universal or idiosyncratic and will generally set up a value system that if something feels more universal, somehow it has much more value. Thoughts that are idiosyncratic seem like something that should be disposed of or at least held very lowly. 
extroverted sensation. It's another topic we can put out there. And Jung says of this, they seek an accumulation of actual experiences of concrete objects. And extroverted sensate types can become so riveted on the reality out there that sometimes they cannot recognize that other things may be happening at the same time. Neither of us, none of us, I think, are um, extroverted sensate types. Hell no. <laughs> As we it, it, bump our heads yeah. into door frames regularly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and are, are often on a very different wavelength conversationally of that the sensate type wants practical aspects, what you can see, hear, taste, feel, whereas uh, the extroverted intuitives, which I'm sure we'll get to next, uh, are thinking about concepts and ideas. And yeah, but what's the general framework here that's the operating principle? Never mind all these little details. And it's interesting to notice as you uh, kind of figure out your own typology you know, where the sticking points or the real rub is uh, with people who have a different typology and to be able to frame it that way, that when we really get into what feels to me, when we get into the weeds of sensate stuff, I start to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. I don't, I want to, don't want to do trees. I want to do forest. And this leads us a little bit back to the Myers-Briggs sequencing of things, which is quite different from Jung's perspective. Jung felt that his analysands would do best to study his literature on typology and then over years of self-reflection come to decide which of the functions are primary and in introverted or extroverted combinations. The Myers-Briggs survey purports to do this rather efficiently and quickly. And then we have the four letters that are given, which also lets us know which function or proposes which function is totally inferior. The inferior function, the least developed function is the one that's also considered deepest in the unconscious. So sometimes Jung would talk about, you know, the door through which the devil comes mm. or the door through which the daimonic comes. So extroverted sensation as a inferior function would make uh, touch and sensation and smell and, and environments both incredibly complicated to navigate but also compelling in their effect on the individual. And numinous. And numinous. I'm also thinking about my friends who work in the visual arts. Um, I have some friends who are designers. And for them, extroverting their sensation is this incredible joy of noticing color and shape, taking a room and making it organized in multiple layers of order so that the objects in the room are in conversation to each other. Now, I will often be in a situation where they're doing this or have done it, and I'll also notice that the furniture can be uncomfortable or that the color palette feels um, uncomfortable to me, where an extroverted sensation type won't necessarily track those things because the design elements are precise. So, for instance, um, I've seen some designer friends, you know, paint the interior of a house all white, just one shade of white, have three pieces of Italian furniture in the living room and nothing else. And it's this exquisite, minimalist ocean of white. And, and I'll walk in and think, who would want to sit on that couch? <laughs> like, uh, whose who's butt could tolerate sitting on a bench in your living room? Even though it's very interesting to look at, 
so I mean, there is this this various ways that we monitor the the physical environment and talk to ourselves about it. So, for instance, an extroverted sensei type might really enjoy watching um, sports, watching a football game, watching any number of soccer game. But at the same time, it's very unlikely that they would notice that the person next to them is trying to say something to them about the game or is getting ready to uh, to reveal something on an interpersonal level. So the external environment carries all of this kind of magic, compelling libido. And then we'll tumble into extroverted intuition, which I think ah. there is a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump in with a definition, but extroverted intuition becomes deeply engaged with the possibilities of the outer objects. My experiences with a, a friend, along with a, a group of other people, uh, we cook and it, we'll have a long weekend, all of us together. And she is a wonderful cook and loves cooking. And I remember years ago, when we uh, first had these uh, long weekends of being astonished that she follows the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I tend to look at a recipe, uh, something like spaghetti sauce and, and take it as a jumping off place. It's like, Oh, I get it. You know, we're going to do some onions and some garlic and I don't have any uh, green peppers, but I have some artichoke hearts. I bet that would be interesting of very different orientation that for me really provided a great illustration of the difference between extroverted sensation and extroverted intuition. That's a yeah. wonderful comparison. Joseph, you, you said that your, your analytic downfall is that you tend to find it difficult not to give advice. <laughs> and mine uh, is definitely in this area because I I do have this thing that happens for me where I just can see possibilities in in outer situations. And sometimes uh, an analysand will bring to me something that's going on at work or an idea that she has about, you know, what she wants to do with this hobby that she's been developing. And I will all of a sudden have this whole plan in my mind for her about how she can set up an Instagram yeah. business based on this. And then she can do this. And there's this thing that she could do. And I just have to put my hands over my mouth and not jump in and start uh, spinning this whole kind of intuitive fantasy about yeah. the, the five-year plan about what she would should do with this idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I can't quite resist. <laughs> so there's a great quote where Jung's talking about extroverted intuition. And he says, for people who are really potent in this instinct, it's as though the whole life has vanished into the new situation. <laughs> Which is yeah, that's that's really that's that that feel it rings really true. I mean, I know um <laughs> I, I remember when we had the first conversation about starting the podcast, you know, which was the sort of this idea that came out of my extroverted intuition. And you guys were both really enthusiastic, of course. <laughs> and I remember driving home from that meeting and thinking, what the? F am I doing? I'm so busy. Why am I taking this on? But then I, I just, the answer came back. It's like, but I get energy from this. Yeah. You know? And I, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop beating myself up for, for developing new ideas and, and adding them to my plate, because that's the thing that keeps me going. Well, I think relative to the project here that you've spearheaded, Lise, is that extroverted intuition has an uncanny ability to, to determine the red, yellow, and green light of something. Hmm. where there's a real sense that it's time to proceed, now's the time, or it's time to slow down, or it's time to stop. And extra-rooted intuitives have, a, have an uncanny ability around flowing or receding, depending on these um, mysterious ways of perceiving situations and people. Well, 
And you've talked about that with your own entree into the Jungian world, that, that it was a, a, a very much an intuition that the time was now. My intuition is more introverted. So um, for people who know me, that can make me seem somewhat impulsive because they won't necessarily have heard uh, me talking about the emerging potential, but I'm experiencing it internally. And when there's a certain point that it clicks, then all of a sudden it's a green light for me and I'm going, but I may not have explained that to anyone else. <laughs> I think for all of us, is this right that for all three of us, no, uh, two of us have introverted intuition. And one, I think for you, Lisa, it, intuition is your primary function and it's extroverted. And uh, you are the idea generator, the possibility seer of, of all time of like, oh my goodness, here come all these ideas. And it's exhausting. And, well, and then, but we all get lit up by them and we all, of course, have ideas too. But then we do have to turn to our sensate function because they need to be implemented. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's how these things all work together. <laughs> this is on the, the case for the real world out there. That, um, that was a great idea. And now we'll come the sitting down and make it, making it happen. The ideas that come out of an extroverted and intuitive place are, are really important in, in life. And to be able to kind of access that is important because it allows us to generate future possibilities. And some, some typologies, this is a much harder thing for them. And when, when someone is in my practice and they're feeling really stuck, you know, and maybe in, in their career or, or something or their relationship, and I'll encourage them, you know, let yourself have a fantasy. Mm. I mean, I think I'm leaning more here into intuition in particular than, than, than extroversion, but there's some, there's some relationship there. Some people have a really hard time allowing themselves to have a fantasy. And I think sometimes that's partially due to typology. And I'll always say, don't, don't restrict yourself. Don't edit yourself. First have the fantasy. And then there's what Freud called this wonderful phrase, a compromise with reality. But you, you've got to generate the image first and it's got to have some excitement for you, some energy. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you, you know, maybe it's not exactly possible in that form. Well, I think about how infectious your idea about starting the podcast was. <laughs> that, you know, Deb and I were not thinking about starting a podcast. And you kind of came forward with this possibility, but not just that it was a possibility, but that it was full of so much certainty and feeling that it, it was inspiring and it inspired my confidence that it could happen, even though we, yeah. we didn't know the first thing about how to proceed. And that is exactly where we started as with that extroverted uh, intuition of let's just jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's ju just jump in. Okay. We need some microphones, right? And we need <laughs> this and we need that. So I can see, you know, the plus side, certainly, uh, but also we can be abducted. Yes. <laughs> by some great idea. And I know I have found myself, you know, somewhere out in the cosmos. And as I'm flying by Uranus, I have to say, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Yep. That has happened to me too. <laughs> so all of this talk about typology is part of a central idea in Jungian work the idea of differentiation. All of us start with the masa confusa, which is that our contents of consciousness and the unconscious are all in a kind of roiling cloud, including our various functions. And one of the reasons that Jung wanted people to really meditate on these distinctions is so that they could actually move through life with a functional direction and goal. When the functions are, are melded with each other into weird amalgams, 
people have a tendency to overfocus on what is irrelevant. So I'm going to read a, a quote to start this uh, bit of our conversation. Differentiation means the development of differences, the separation of parts from the whole. In this work, I employ the concept of differentiation chiefly with respect to the psychological functions. So long as a function is still so fused with one or more of the other functions, thinking with feeling, feeling with sensation, etc., that it is unable to operate on its own, it is in an archaic condition, not differentiated, not separated from the whole as a special part and existing by itself. Undifferentiated thinking is incapable of thinking apart from other functions. It is continually mixed up with sensations and feeling and intuitions, just as undifferentiated feeling is mixed up with sensations and fantasies. So there's a real cost at not having this clean process. And relative to establishing a goal for ourselves, he writes, without differentiation, direction is impossible. Since the direction of a function towards a goal depends on its elimination of anything irrelevant. Fusion with the irrelevant precludes direction. Only a differentiated function is capable of being directed. And it's another way of thinking about both ourselves, but also our analysands that are caught in the weeds that don't actually facilitate their lives. Say more about that. So I think we've all had clinical examples where people can think to themselves, gosh, you know, I really do need to look for another job. I mean, everything in me rationally knows I could be making more money. My career is stale. I know that my resume would allow me to pursue something much more substantial. And yet they have a feeling that they would be abandoning their friends in the neighborhood. And then consequently, they can't take hold of a definitive goal because the thinking and feeling function have created a kind of amalgam that creates a stalemate. Jung said something that if we are properly organized, when we are thinking, we are not feeling. And when we are feeling, we are not thinking. That the other moves into the inferior and unconscious position. Now, in modern psychology, which I think has a certain kind of romanticism in it, people might think that all those things should be melded together so that we're having a particularly holistic experience. But from an analytic standpoint, without a priority in the capacity to evaluate, we find that we're always stymied. Mm -hmm. So if thinking is your primary function, then thinking needs to be used in order to create a value system that then empowers you to decide what is more important. If feeling is your primary function, then feeling is going to decide what's important. If both of them are mucked together, then you're not going to know what's important. And if we don't know what's important, then we can't find the libido to take a move, to take an action. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. I think you're making such an important point here because those are the two functions, uh, one of which will be extroverted and the other will be introverted. But those are our two decision-making and valuing functions. So if they get mushed together and conflated, it really does stymie us. Whatever those values are, uh, based more on a subjective experience, in the case of feeling function being primary, or objective, one or the other has to have primary place 
of differentiating, valuing, and thus setting the direction toward a goal. Can't have your cake and eat it too. No, and just as you said, Deb, there is a kind of reciprocity between thinking and feeling to create a balance, but they can't both share the exact same space in the psyche. Mm -hmm. There needs to be an apportioning process. This is also true with intuition and sensation. And one of the kind of maddening moments that I sometimes experience with uh, friends and some analysands is that they'll be moving towards a decision that they've made. For instance, well, I decided that I was going to go and apply for a volunteer position. But when I was trying to pull out of the driveway, there was so much traffic, and then a car had run out of gas. And so I thought, well, it's not meant to be because the universe is making it really difficult. And so then I won't proceed. And to me, that's a tremendous inappropriate amalgam of intuition and sensation that people will have a feeling of what's possible and then they will simultaneously misinterpret the concrete environment around them and then cause that to thwart their mm -hmm. ability to be libidinized by the potential in a situation. And it always shows up as, well, it's obvious that it wasn't meant to be because if it was meant to be, it would be easy. Mm -hmm. There's so much to say about Jung's version of typology. It's based on his arcane studies in the doctrine of humors, in the quaternity of all things that shows up in many, many different systems. It's part of his whole theory of wholeness, of what is in the conscious versus what is in the unconscious mind, and the tension between these things, which is even part of his idea about Gnosticism and how that is an archetype that seems relevant to humanity. One of the things that I hope in our bringing forward introversion and now extroversion is that people will come to appreciate the profundity of Jung's use of typology and that it extends far beyond whether or not we're compatible in the workplace. And I would hope that maybe it would revive people's interest in going to primary source, which really would be Jung mm -hmm. rather than Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you, you just brought up this really important point about typology and wholeness that we've talked about a little bit already. But, you know, Jung felt that we both, that we all have both an introverted and an extroverted side and that one is dominant, but we can get too one-sided and that if you're too fiercely extroverted, there's something that just drops into the unconscious he says, the more complete the conscious attitude of extroversion is, the more infantile and archaic the unconscious attitude will be. The egoism, which characterizes the extro extrovert's unconscious attitude, goes far beyond mere childish selfishness. It verges on the ruthless and brutal. So I think it's just a warning that any attitude can become too one-sided and that as part of a pursuit of wholeness, we do need to be aware of, make room for, and even develop the opposite attitude. And that is where I think relationships really can help us and others as we rub up against one another uh, in our families, neighborhoods, cultures. Can we use the differences that we find between ourselves and other people to take us back inside and cause us to reflect about, you know, and what is that in me? Is it, you know, this person is way out in left field and driving me crazy? Or what might that tell me about myself and why I get irritated? Can we be, become curious about it so that we use our daily interactions with people 
to refer back to our own typologies just as a framework of like, oh, this is what happens when my own sensate function is challenged by this person or this situation. This is what happens when my thinking function is challenged by somebody being very objective, calm, uh, matter of fact about something that I, I feel passionate about. All of just uh, our real world interactions and activities, if we can use typology as a framework, uh, can help us notice where our strengths and growing edges are. That's beautifully said, Deb. And this is at the core of Jung's theory of midlife, that the unlived part of our lives start rattling the cages underneath. And one of the ways to categorize the unlived life has to do with the undeveloped functions in our typology. So with all this as a frame, maybe it's time to transition into a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you. And it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. That's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Mm -hmm. Today's dreamer is a 28-year-old woman who works as a manager in a women's charity, and here's the dream. I am perhaps four or five months pregnant, and I am at my granddad's house. I am miscarrying. There is blood and tissue everywhere, and I can feel it happening very viscerally. My granddad and a woman I don't know are helping to clean it up. There is going to be a party, and I don't want anyone to know what has happened. Family has arrived now, and I am distracted and worried about people finding out. My, my granddad can see this and says to me, why don't you go up to my room? This is so I can hide the bucket full of blood. When I get upstairs, the bucket is almost completely clean, just some remnants, but anyone finding it wouldn't know what had happened. Suddenly, my aunt enters the room, and I kick the bucket under the bed to hide it. She talks to me urgently and intensely. I'm not sure what about, but I am distracted. Later, a miscarriage happens again, but even more intensely. This time, I see a noticeable baby, small, long, pale, bluish, I think. I should call the hospital, but I don't want to. I worry that it might be a medical emergency, but I'm still resistant. For context, she says, where to start? I would make this shorter if I could, but it all feels relevant. My granddad has terminal lung cancer, which we found out about four to five months ago. While we get on fine, I don't have the kind of relationship with him which would involve sharing confidences like in the dream. I have never been pregnant or miscarried and do not want a baby, 
but I've been recently diagnosed with a teratoma, an ovarian cyst, which can grow baby-like features. This has been causing me excruciating pain on and off, getting significantly worse around four to five months ago. I have recently started on a new form of birth control to control the pain which is causing stomach issues. A month ago, I was signed off work due to burnout, depression, and exhaustion. I have a lot of health anxiety about the cyst as I am worried I have further health problems which haven't yet been picked up. I've had various dreams about pregnancy in the past, including my partner performing an abortion on me and giving birth, but then not being able to find the baby. The feelings in the dream were worry, distraction, disgust, fear, being supported by my granddad and the woman. And she also mentions that she has a lot of contact with hospitals and doctors. And like in the dream, she experiences a lot of resistance to this all and finds it stressful and anxiety producing, especially having to advocate for herself. This is a dream that has, in the context of our typology discussion, immediately evoked a lot of feeling in me. Uh, I noticed that she says her main feelings in the dream were worry, distraction, disgust, and fear, supported by her granddad and the woman. The main feeling in me is sadness. Yeah. I can feel a little teary about this. And when... I'm working with someone, I always pay attention, and sometimes it comes up really strong, like it does here, of that's the first thing I notice is what I'm feeling. Yeah, and, and it is very noticeable that that feeling is missing mm. for her and that it's so strong in you. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes uh, we can carry a feeling that belongs to the other person. Mm -hmm. And some it's sort of like I'm catching it from her. Because she hasn't quite allowed it. Mm -hmm. This kind of recitation of loss that's in the dream and in the context. I mean, in the dream, she loses two pregnancies. Yes. And then in the context, we hear about her own, her own health issues and the impending loss of her grandfather. And, you know, the pain here uh, that I think probably anybody listening to this dream would feel, of, oh, my gosh, four or five months along. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And here's the new possibility in the image and symbol of a baby. And then the miscarrying blood and tissue everywhere, uh, a bucket full of blood. But there's going to be a party and she doesn't want anyone to know what happened of the necessity of hiding the loss and the pain. Yeah. There's a sense of real persona that we we have to hide it. We have to kick it under the the bed to make sure no one sees. We have to kind of protect the persona here. Yeah. Put a Uh, good face on mm -hmm. it. I'm attuned to the things that you guys are saying. The idea of a miscarriage as a kind of casting off. And is she casting off the grief that she might be possibly feeling for her grandfather, the grief that she may be having about problems with her own body and other situations, a kind of sloughing out um, rather than letting a feeling come to term, come to its fullness inside of her the grandfather colludes with cleaning it up and this is not uncommon i i can think of my own grandparents with their own illnesses wanting things to not be terribly emotional wanting things to be highly contained and kind of sanitizing it sanitizing it i remember as a kid you know when one of my grandparents was diagnosed with cancer that at that point, I was born in 62, you didn't even use the word cancer. It was the big C. Or CA. Um, So that there was all of this, you know, excessive kicking it under the bed kind of feeling that I understand as, as a not uncommon defense against these existential realities. It's also interesting that 
that something, does something happen between the two miscarriages that is essentially fertilizing? Because if we were to use a naturalistic lens, if there was a miscarriage and then a second miscarriage, we might imagine in this mythical world, there's been a recovery, a refertilization, and then a casting off a second time. So I'm finding myself scanning the dream for any kind of subtle refertilizing that happens in the dream world between those two events. Maybe, but sometimes when I see a doubling like this in a dream, I, I sometimes it's for emphasis. That's true. Yeah. It's like yeah. in case you didn't get it the first time, and here it is, it's even more graphic, and there's even this little baby. Yeah. I wonder if there's a clue here. She goes up to the granddad's room, and uh, she's going up there in order to hide the bucket full of blood. When I get upstairs, the bucket is almost completely clean, just some remnants, but anyone finding it wouldn't know what had happened. And then her aunt enters the room, and she's able to kick the bucket under the bed, which I wonder if that's an indication that what the dream ego feels is a terrible uh, disaster. I mean, that's such a graphic image. Is actually not so bad. Of, I wonder if it's pointing to um, a tendency to feel something very intensely that somehow it, there's a countervailing thing where it says, oh, actually, it's not as much as a dis of a disaster as as you thought, or not as much of a shame as you thought. There's not as much to hide, yeah, as he thought. Right, and and in fact, you can just go ahead and kick it under the bed because there's not even enough in it to spill. I'd like to broaden the category just a little bit. If this person were my analysis, and I might also focus out on just a few phrases and see where that goes in her imagination. So worried about people finding out, finding it, but they wouldn't know, under the bed to hide it. So I might also just ask for general associations to, what is it that you don't want people to find out about you? What is it that you feel most urgently that you wish to hide from other people and perhaps hide from yourself. So the, the great category of, of secret and hiding, even though it's personally distressing, highly distressing, but dreams also don't talk to us about things we already know. So there may be something that's being hidden that is different from what you might imagine. And I wonder, going back to Deb's earlier point, if part of what she's hiding from herself is grief. Very possible. And, you know, because it's sort of like we all see it, <laughs> but but it's hidden from her. And I, I wonder about uh, this, I mean, pregnancy loss, which of course in real life this dreamer has not experienced, but it is such a profound grief and and it's a very private grief, usually. The world, sometimes the world doesn't even know about it, which in many ways makes it worse sometimes. And so I, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm curious about, um, you know, the, the other dream of the partner performing an abortion on her. And I'm, I'm curious about sort of attachment stuff. That's interesting. Uh, and of course, the symbol of pregnancy and a baby here. Uh, you know, it's so often about the new thing, the new possibility, the something that's new in in us. And I I wonder about what gets cut off in the images of miscarrying or or abortion. And I am wondering about what she says at the very end. Uh, that she has a lot of contact with hospitals and doctors and, like in the dream, experience a lot of resistance to it as I find it often stressful and anxiety-inducing. 
especially having to advocate for myself. So I'm wondering what comes up for her in her work world in the medical realm and whether this is indicating someplace that's not a good fit. Uh, it might be simply around advocating for herself in any environment. But I'm also wondering particularly about what, what may be going on in terms of being in the medical field. And she's the manager of a woman's, a women's charity. So broadening that out to the whole category of, of the feminine and the feminine creative role biologically in being pregnant. Taking all that in, I'm coming back to one of her comments, Deb, which I think is relevant to what you were saying, is that in the work environment, working in healthcare, mm -hmm. she finds herself provoked in one way or another, and that she's saturated with these fears of being ill, these fears of undiscovered health problems, that something is hiding in her body that is dangerous to her. Now, we don't want to disregard that. Of course, people should get all the medical attention that they deserve and need. But if we hold a symbolic attitude and we come back, is there, again, a secret that is making her feel unwell which on one level she wants it to be diagnosed, on another level, like the grandfather and in the dream wants to kind of kick it under the bed so it doesn't have to be looked at. And I'm also thinking about this feeling of disgust that she puts in the references. And I'm stepping way, way back to make this oh. comment. On some level, is she feeling that there is something disgusting about her own creative potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. it sounds really interesting. very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. But we can we can have these kind of tortured patinas around something which could essentially be extremely positive. Yeah. And that the story that, well, when I'm creative, I only give birth to monstrous things or can't give birth to anything that can sustain, give birth to one's life, give birth to a new direction, give birth to some other very intimate potential. Yeah. I think you're really onto something there, Joseph. Uh, and I noticed how Lisa and I both resonated to it. You know, you started like, maybe this is a reach, but we were both like, yes. Mm -hmm. And to augment that even more, she has this physical condition of the teratoma that has been causing her excruciating pain on and off. So I wonder if her physical uh, condition and difficulty is the physical outpicturing of exactly what you were saying about can't give birth to her creative potential, that there's something monstrous about it, just like there's something we could use the word monstrous about having this ovarian cyst that has baby like features. Mm -hmm. That's awful for a young woman at age 28 and has a parallels in the symbolic uh, images of the dream. I'd also like to just quickly toss in a bit about astrology. Hmm. That at 28 years old, she's entering into her first Saturn return mm -hmm. or is preparing to do that. And Jung was very interested in astrology, and, and so am I. And during the Saturn return, there is a profound upwelling of unlived life, which happens again at 56. And if we live long enough, it'll happen a third time. So unconscious material often starts rumbling very, very powerfully. People often between 28 and 30 change careers, wind up ending uh, relationships or marriages, and wind up moving in a certain kind of corrected direction, although it comes as a, initially as a kind of forced dynamic. The secret about going through the Saturn return gracefully 
is to know that you're in a time of change and to decide that you're going to embrace that rather than be dragged along by it. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.